We are back with another episode of the Real Questions with Claire podcast. Let me apologise first and foremost to listeners because I've been delayed with this next episode. I've just been juggling so many deadlines. The the most important one of all being the first draft chapter for my PhD thesis, which, as you can imagine, took a lot of time. I did strangely enjoy doing it even though it took a lot out of me and my brain was completely fried so I wouldn't have been able to do justice to today's episode so thank you so much for your patience. Today we are going to be looking at the question is Christianity a copycat religion? We did begin last week and I said we'll continue to be kind of um, hopping in and out of that looking at this overall question does God exist and we started looking at the idea of worldviews and arguments and then I talked about the fact that we're going to continue exploring as the podcast progresses arguments for God's existence. But I want to have a look at today uh, an argument or an objection that I keep seeing making the rounds on social media, media. I've had conversations with people who make this objection. And that is, you know, Christianity is a copycat religion and it's copied essentially from um, Egyptian ancient Egyptian religion, Kemeticism. So let's let's get into that today. Welcome to the Real Questions of Claire podcast, where we keep it real by asking questions. This is a space for black Christians who know the challenges of living out your faith in this 2024. Each week, we look at a question of culture, faith or doubt, and consider how we might respond. If Christianity is copied, then obviously it's plagiarized, it's not original, And I think the real strength of feeling behind this objection in today's conversations is that Christianity has been and continues to be this colonizing, plagiarizing, demonizing of other cultures, religion that goes around taking over people's culture and then absorbing the bits that it wants to. So around Christmas time, you'll you'll see lots of people talking about Christmas being a pagan celebration, the same with Easter as well. And this has come from Christianity's aggressive stance to um, neutralize other worldviews. And if it's doing this, then it's not unique because it needs to depend upon the, the indigenous beliefs of other people. And then it also can't claim to be true in that it can't claim to be exclusively true, i.e. the only way to God. And so when we read something like John 14, 6, where Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth and the life. Yeah, you might want to say it. And, you know, to have the audacity to say that you're the way, the truth and the life is very um, upsetting for some. I mentioned a debate on um, YouTube between Christians about um, the exclusive claims of Christianity and how one traditionist was very angry that Jesus made such a claim. He considered this to be very arrogant of Jesus to make. So if Christianity is plagiarized, all of the above, what I've said, it kind of lands in the space of, well, it's just one religion among many that has done, you know, considerable harm. And we we can take it for what it is, but it's nothing more than that. So these are the implications of or all the conclusions we could say we might draw if Christianity is indeed a copycat religion. So one of the ways we see this allegation, this objection that Christianity is just a copied religion, we see it most clearly in this idea of cometicism or the cometic system. And in Urban Apologetics, a great book, I'll leave again all the details in the show notes, Vince Bantu this guy's doing some fantastic scholarship. Anyway, he says, he he defines Kemeticism as the revival of ancient Egyptian religious practices. The modern Kemetic movement gained popularity in the 1970s and has been on the rise in recent years. And in this chapter on uh, Kemeticism in, in, in the book Urban Apologetics, Bantu begins by describing how a friend of his called him to try and speak to, I think it's his father-in-law, the friend's father-in-law, who had decided to leave Christianity because he now felt he that Christianity was just a copycat of um, ancient Egyptian religion. And this guy used to be a deacon in the church or an elder of some sort, I think a deacon, and was now willing to walk away from his faith. 
And I think that story really um, encapsulates just how deeply this objection goes. So behind this idea of cometicism, you have um, Afrocentric scholarship. So you've got people like John Henry Clark, John G. Jackson, and others as well. And we're going to be investigating some of their claims, but I think it's really important to note that this allegation that Christianity is copied from ancient Egyptian religion is very much linked to this search for giving ourselves roots, a, a black identity, the black diaspora, as we navigate a world beset by racism of, of many different kinds, this search for the truth about where black people come from, about where our history is lied, everything that was stripped away because of the transatlantic slave trade. And I think it's really important to also acknowledge that this spectre of slavery uh, haunts this search for identity. You cannot undermine the significance of slavery. And I think I mentioned this before, but the, the academic Christina Sharp, she talks about this uh, in her book, In the Wake on Blackness and Being, and talks about the wake on the wa- on a water when a ship goes over water and you see the wake of the waves that is left behind. That is still the reverberating effects of slavery upon black people's lives today. And I think it's Um, some very strong argumentation there she does it she explores it in a very masterful way so yeah this question is christianity just a copycat religion and the allegation that it's copied ancient egyptian religious practices and therefore african practices all right is strongly tied to this search for roots and identity there's something very ironic behind all of this and that is that those who make this claim, like John Henry Clark, John G. Jackson, etc., they lean heavily upon white scholarship, European scholarship, which is interesting because often the objection is Christianity is a white man's religion. It was given to black people. It was coerced, imposed upon black people because of slavery. And therefore, we should reject it and go back to our roots. And our roots are cometic spiritual practices but by that same logic then if we are depending upon white scholars and I'm going to explain some of that in a moment then surely we should reject this idea that Christianity was copied from ancient Egypt because the sources that these Afrocentric scholars are getting um, their information from are curated by white scholars now, all that does is tell you that the logic of rejecting Christianity because we we allege that it's a white man's religion is flawed. We know factually, historically, that is incorrect and that Christianity was alive and well in Africa prior to the transatlantic slave trade. But all that does is tell you that the idea of rejecting something because white people gave it to black people, and I do not believe that at all, that logic is flawed. And what we need to do when it comes to any worldview, any truth claim is investigate the claims and see if they can stand up under scrutiny. So that's what we're going to do in a moment is investigate those claims. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe to the podcast and follow for more on social media at Real Questions UK. So some of these white scholars that we should be aware of are um, 19th century mystics and there's a few of them. Helena Blavatsky, Alvin Boyd Kuhn, and someone we're going to focus on today is Gerald Assey. And I've mentioned this, I think, in nearly every episode since um, we started. The unspoken documentary by the Jude 3 Project examines this. All right, you've got Dr. Eric Mason on there and Dr. Vince Bantu. If you watch it on Amazon Prime, you can rent it or you can buy it. I bought it and I want to support Jude Free Project and all, and all the work that they're doing. Around 32 minutes, you'll see their analysis of where this, this scholarship is coming from. So if we consider Gerald Massey, someone whom John Henrik Clark in the Unspoken documentary is seen on video saying that Gerald Massey was very informative to his his work and his thesis that Christianity uh, emerged from 
uh, the Kemetic practices of Egypt, Gerald Massey, interestingly enough, didn't actually go to Egypt. Now, this is from an essay by a guy called Brian H. Murray, and I'll put the link into the resources. And in this essay, we learn that, and I'm quoting, although he lived through the age when Thomas Cook and Son transformed the Nile from distant, exotic place of fable and myth to a middle-class tourist destination, Massey never visited Egypt. Now, that is that is something we need to to take a look at because if Massey produced such a large corpus of work upon Egypt but didn't visit it himself, that means he was using secondhand sources from people who did visit. And actually this essay by Murray flags some of the problems by that then translated into Massey's work by this secondhand information. And I'm not here to say that testimony, testimony handed down, isn't necessarily um, reliable. I mean, that's how we get the gospel narratives, the the gospel biographies of Jesus's life. It's through eyewitness testimony. But given that, you know, we would expect any researcher, academic or detective or, or police detective or journalist who they're looking at a particular topic, you would expect them to go to the site, right? You'd expect them to go to the location of where whatever events they're investigating happened. Massey didn't go. And yet he is, as I've said, very influential to Afrocentric scholarship that argues that Christianity was copied from Kemetic religion. In this essay by Murray, he continues, rather than read Massey as a prophet of racial liberalism, it is perhaps more appropriate to read his search for the origins of civilization in Africa as analogous to another contemporary search for origins, the geographical quest for the source of the Nile. Like the explorers who sought the source of Egypt's fertility in the lakes of Central Africa, Massey's search for the African origins of civilization sprang from his imperial enthusiasm. Like many of his contemporaries, Massey paradoxically read sub-Saharan Africans as both the primitive ancestors and the degenerative descendants of the glorious Egyptians, end quote. This is huge, because what uh, Murray is saying in this essay, was when we actually read Massey's work, and there's examples of it in the essay that I'm quoting from, what you see is not an attempt to put black people on the map, right? It's not an attempt to say black people are the founders of great civilizations. It's more to do with his curiosity uh, about Africa and Egypt, and it lands in this imperial place. So it's not doing, his work is not doing what these Afrocentric scholars then make it do. Okay, and Massey isn't trying to um, make the case for black greatness. He's making the case for his own intrigue and curiosity into into Africa and into Egypt, it would seem from at least Murray's reading of his work. And this idea that there's this there's this idea of Africans who are primitive ancestors, uh, degenerative descendants of the glorious Egyptians, it comes from another idea that in another essay I'll put into the show notes called the Hermetic Hypothesis, its origin and functions in time perspective. This idea that when white Europeans encountered and found, you know, the the glorious architecture and civilization and, and culture of, of Egypt, they couldn't believe that it was in Africa. And so what they did was invent this idea of the Hamites, that the Hamites were a race of Europeans who lived in Africa and taught the degenerative primitive black Negro the ways their their ways and so the the majesty of Egypt doesn't come from black people it comes from the Hamites this European race before so this is all not doing taken together it's not doing what these Afrocentric scholars are saying it does we need to we need to question it for bespoke training in Christian apologetics for your small group or church to explore questions like does God exist How can God be good when there's so much suffering in the world? And is Christianity the white man's religion? 
drop an email to hello at realquestions.co.uk. Let's examine further then some more work by uh, John G. Jackson. John G. Jackson, as I said, is a, a scholar who I've got his book right in front of me. Uh, I've got a couple of his. This one is called Christianity Before Christ. And the, the basic thesis is that there were many Christ figures before Jesus. And if that's the case, then obviously Jesus isn't special. So one Christ figure that John G. Jackson appeals to is Krishna. Now, Krishna is a Hindu deity, and um, you can read about Krishna in the Mahabharata, the greatest um, epic ever told, and I'm going to quote that in, shortly. But in John G. Jackson's book, Christianity Before Christ, and I, I tell you, I've seen this go around social media. I've had conversations with people who tell me, yeah, yeah there's books out there where it tells us that Jesus wasn't special or unique. There were Christ before him, and they tell me in these conversations... There's another book, I'm going to touch on that in a few episodes' time, um, The 16 Crucified Christs. And so this is used as data to support the idea that Christianity was copied. Now, in this book, Jackson says, and I'm reading, uh, says, Krishna was crucified. In Indian art, he is pictured as hanging on a cross with arms extended. Jesus was crucified. In Christian art, he is shown hanging on the cross with arms extended. While on the cross, Krishna was pierced by an arrow. While on the cross, Jesus was pierced by a spear. Krishna said to the hunter who shot him, Go, hunter, through my favour to heaven, the abode of the gods. Jesus said to one of the thieves, Verily I say unto thee, This day shalt thou be with me in paradise. End quote. So Jackson asserts that, you know, Krishna, uh, a Hindu deity, was crucified long before Jesus was on the scene. A couple problems with that assertion. First of all, the consensus in scholarship is that crucifixion originated from the Persian Empire and then was perfected by the Romans. But then John G. Jackson, you know, transports it to, to India to say that um, this that, that Krishna was crucified, um, which I, I actually think is just insulting at this point to what Hindus believe. Because if you do a quick search online and if you read, which I'm going to now, an account of the Mahabharata, which um, is an important, like, sacred text to Hindu religion, that the death of Krishna is not by a crucifixion. While hunting, I'm quoting now, while hunting with the arrow, he came across Krishna. By Krishna's own illusory energy, he mistook Krishna's foot to be an animal. Seeing it from a distance through the bushes, he released the arrow and struck Krishna's foot, whereupon the Lord departed from the world worshipped by the gods with Brahma at their head. So the author of this version or this retelling of uh, the Mahabharata, the greatest spiritual epic of all time, is someone called Krishna Dharma. And nowhere in that description do you get the sense of crucifixion. Yes, you get the sense of an arrow piercing um, Krishna. And then I think from that, what John D. Jackson is then, uh, uh, has compared that to Jesus being pierced in the side. I think in the book of John, we get that account. And then blood and water flowed out to confirm his death. But let us take religions on the basis of what they say about themselves. When we start to get into this mode of saying, oh, it was all copied and they're all saying the same thing, it's massively arrogant. It's really condescending to the, the different religious worldviews out there because we haven't done our homework to understand what it is they say about themselves. And it's also not good because often the objection, you know, Christians, you, you're you're following blind faith, you don't think for yourselves, et cetera, et cetera. And then we read this kind of work that John G. Jackson has written. There's no notes in this. You can't find the sources of the information. There's no bibliography in this book. All right. And then when you start to dig, which I have I have done, the sources are questionable. The arguments are questionable. And so my encouragement would be at this point, when wherever you land, whether you're a Christian or not, the same level, the same energy of criticism and critical thinking and interrogation and scrutiny that we bring to Christianity to rightly question the faith, to rightly challenge Christians about what they believe and why they believe it. Bring that same energy to what we're walking into. We need to really do some robust investigation when we're picking up these ideas that Christianity was copied from other religions and they're all saying the same thing. 
when we start to look at the sources as I'm doing now, they're not robust enough. And so then the question then becomes, if the sources aren't robust enough, if they're not standing up under scrutiny, but we still want to say that Christianity was copied, say, from Hinduism, as Jackson argues here, then it comes down to volition. We're choosing to believe that when actually in the light of evidence, it doesn't hold up. The question is why? Do we not want Christianity to be at least, not if not true, to be at least original in its own telling of, of what, it, what it believes? So this has been uh, an introduction to this objection that Christianity is copied uh, from other religions. And I hope that what we're able to take away, uh, first of all, is that we need to do some digging into the sources where these claims are being made. And when we do that, I think we will start to see that it's kind of on some shaky ground. We also need to be aware of the irony that in one hand, we're saying Christianity is a white man's religion because it was given to us by white people. And then on the other hand, building a whole thesis about Christianity being copied from ancient Kemet um, through the work of white scholarship. That is if anything, hypocritical. I don't think the, the, the logic of that argument works anyway, but that, that needs to be drawn to attention. And finally, just the idea of letting religions speak for themselves. I am clearly a Christian. I'm, I'm not I'm a Hindu. I'm not a Muslim. I'm not any other religion. But I need to respect what those religions and what those adherents of those religions say about the religion. It's not for me to shoehorn any of those religions into Christianity and say, well, Christianity copied or they copied from Christianity or they say all the same thing is deeply disrespectful. Okay. We just need to take worldviews, religious or not spiritual, agnostic, we need to take the claims of any worldview on the basis of what they say about themselves and interrogate them with grace, with charity, okay, and with respect. So we'll be coming back to this topic with a part two where we look at more specific examples of um, the claim that Christianity is copied from Kemetic religion, particularly around the idea of the resurrection and the Immaculate Conception. But I hope that has been helpful to you for now. Please leave a review if you've been enjoying the Real Questions podcast. We're probably going to move to um, release dates, of, uh, release day of earlier in the week. It just helped me to manage my time better. And I think it's quite nice to have the episode at the start of the week. So until next time, we keep it real by asking questions. Take care.